Over the past 15 years or so, what I believed and preached has undergone some changes. I started reading my Bible, looking at what it actually said, rather than le reading it through the lens of what I'd been told it says, and what I'd been taught that it says. It's really changed some things, especially in regards to salvation. For example, most of us were told that all we had to do was believe in Jesus and we'd be saved. But if you read your Bible, you come to James 2, 19, it says the demons believe. So whatever believe means, it must be more than what we think it means. Because the demons who were in heaven with God surely believe in him far more than we do. So it must mean something more than that. I personally, years ago, prayed a sinner's prayer. I've encouraged others to pray a sinner's prayer. But there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. That you say these magic words and you're saved. In fact, there's no place in the Bible where anybody became a Christian by actually praying. If you know your Bible, you're going, huh, that's true. I never thought about that. I discovered that reading the Bible sometimes can mess up your theology. Actually, what it really does, it clears it up. It clears it up. Here's another one. If you just pray this prayer or believe, you'll go to heaven when you die. The clear implication is that nothing but praying that prayer or believing is required to be a Christian. So what do you do with all those passages that contradict that? you got four clear passages that say that anybody who continues to practice these sins will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. What do you do with Jesus saying in John 3, 36 that he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him? Or Hebrews 5, 9 that says Jesus became to all those who obey him the source of eternal life. Or Hebrews 10, 26, 27, where it says that if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. What do you do with those verses? Because they're as inspired as John 3, 16, aren't they? Too many preachers preach what they've heard and they interpret the Bible through the lens of what they were taught more than they actually teach what the Bible actually says. They believe that what somebody else believes and said, not really what the Bible actually is saying, is the truth. As a result of this, pretty much people, when we come to those verses that contradict what's, uh, the, what's on our lens, we just ignore them. We just think, oh, we, all you gotta do is believe, so whatever that means, it doesn't mean this is a problem. This morning I'm beginning what I expect to be a seven-week series on predestination and choice. Predestination is known as Calvinism or as Reformed theology. This series will answer incredibly important questions about the role of God and man in how a person becomes a Christian, how a person becomes Christian, and if a person can lose his salvation. We'll look at what the sovereignty of God means. Does he micromanage the details of life, of your life, or does he let you do that? We'll define two incredibly biblically important terms, atonement and grace. We'll talk about what it means to be sanctified. It's going to be a great series for you learning how to study your Bible and learning how to think. My goal is never to tell you what to think. My goal is to teach you how to think. If you learn how to think, you'll know what to think when you haven't been told what to think. Did you get that? If you learn how to think, you'll know what to think when you haven't been told what to think. That's an incredibly important skill. If you've sat under Reformed preaching, you've interpreted the Bible through that lens. You'll see that there are some verses that clearly contradict what you've likely been taught. If you've sat under free will preaching, you've interpreted the Bible through that lens. And you're going to see there's some challenges to what you've been taught. So in other words, I'm going to make everybody mad before it's over, okay? We, we, we good on that? You'll see that there are some verses that challenge what you've been taught. If you love studying the Bible, if you're a willing to allow the Bible to speak for itself, say what it says and mean what it says, 
You're going to love this series. Now, you need to know that there are godly people who differ on this. They're on both sides of this issue. For example, I do not agree with John MacArthur on these issues. But I would recommend you read everything he writes. He's fabulous. I've got his 33 sec New Testament commentary. Well, probably if I had to get rid of a bunch of my books, that would be one of the last things to go. He's written fabulous books on the gospel according to Jesus, the gospel according to God. Great stuff. One of my favorite preachers is Alistair Begg. Some of you might listen to him on RJZ. He's one of my favorite preachers. I've been to his church, to a conference there. But I differ with him on these things. So what this proves is that really famous people can be wrong because, of course, I'm right, okay? <laughs> one of the best things I heard MacArthur say, he said, I guess we're all wrong about something. It's one of my favorite things he ever said. It's going to be real clear where I stand in the end, and it's going to be real clear why I stand there. So some of you might stand somewhere now, but you're not really sure why. You couldn't argue it. You'd be in trouble. Now, I hope you're familiar with the word hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. A hermeneutic is a method or theory of interpretation. Everybody has one. Now, I'm going to give you what, uh, uh, some of the essentials of mine. They'll make sense to you. So whenever I'm reading the Bible, this is, what's, this is the lens through which I'm processing what I'm reading. If it's in the Bible, it's true. The Bible never contradicts itself. Verses that may appear to contradict others actually complement and or complete those verses. Every verse in the Bible is to be interpreted in light of every other verse in the Bible. The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. If the plain sense makes sense, don't try to make it mean something else. Any obscure and or difficult to understand verses should be interpreted in light of verses that are clear. And then the last one I'll give you today. If you have to explain away a lot of clear verses to hold a theological position, it's a bad position. Oh, that's not what that means. Oh, that's not what that means. So we're going to spend the first two weeks giving our attention to understanding these two sides. I'll be explaining the beliefs of both sides in these messages. Later we'll look at in more depth at some of these things. But I need to begin with some history. The collection of churches after Jesus died for the next few hundred years eventually began to be known as the Catholic Church. Catholic meaning universal. It grew to be enormously powerful because it basically wed with the Roman Empire. So it became rich and powerful. The Crusades were fought by Catholic Christians. Only the priests had Bibles. So the priests would tell you what God said. You had no idea what he said because you didn't have a Bible to check it out. And so that's how, that's how life was. Now, along the way, there were some Catholic priests who began to see that what the Catholic Church was teaching was not what the Bible was saying, and they rebelled. The two most famous of those are Martin Luther, a German, and John Calvin, who was a Frenchman. And so in the 16th century, they rebelled against the church and, and uh, did uh, what became, it started what became known as the Protestant Reformation. And so that's where all the Protestant churches came out of that. Basically, Lutherans follow Martin Luther. Basically, Calvin, uh, Presbyterians follow Calvin. Later along came John Wesley on the other side of the issue from these guys who started Methodism. And so that's how this all began to evolve. Calvin lived from 1509 to 1564. The term Calvinism, again, as I said earlier, eventually also began to be called Reformed. So reform theology. Its adherents agree to five major points. I've listed them there in your outline with one sentence explanations. You'll notice as I go through these, if you take the first letter off of these five points, they create a word, an acrostic that spells tulip. So if you're familiar with this, you'll, be real, you'll know that. So here are the five points of Calvinism and, and a little bit of why they believe them. Number one, the first thing they believe is total depravity. Total depravity means that man is utterly incapable of discovering and choosing God. 
Romans 10, 3, 10 to 12 tells us there's none righteous, not even one. There's no one who seeks after God. They believe that man is so broken by sin that he can have no part in his own salvation. In other words, God must save him entirely in spite of himself. Total depravity, number two. They believe in unconditional election. They believe that God's choice of who will be saved has nothing to do with man or his choices. God's choice of who will be saved has nothing to do with man or any of his choices. So in other words, God chooses who will be saved. They call them the elect. And God chooses who will not be saved. They believe that who God saves has nothing to do with how any of those people ever live and nothing to do with any of the choices those people ever make. So God makes one man and decides he will go to heaven. He makes another man decides he will go to hell. Now some of you are shocked by this, but their answer is, he is God, he can do as he pleases. One of their verses is John 15, 16, which says, where Jesus says to his disciples, key point, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, they do believe that everybody who wants to be saved can be saved, but they only believe that the elect will want to be saved. So if someone doesn't want to be saved, it's because they weren't part of the elect. Unconditional election. Number three, because of that belief, they believe in limited atonement. Limited atonement. Calvinists believe that Christ died for the elect, not for the whole world. Only for the elect. In Matthew 1 it says Jesus would save his people from their sins. In John 10 15 Jesus says that he lays down his life for his sheep. So they believe that Jesus died for those who would be his. He did not die for those who would not be his. Those who are not a part of the elect. So atonement Christ's death was not unlimited, meaning it was sufficient for everyone, but rather it was limited, it was only sufficient to save some. Limited atonement, number four. Their fourth belief is irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. This means that when God calls his elect, they cannot resist. Remember, I told you in the first point, total depravity, that man is incapable of having anything to do with his salvation. That's what they believe. And so therefore, for him to be saved, God has to do everything. He, man cannot have a part in it. And they, one of the verses they, they use for this is John six thirty seven, where it says, all, Jesus says, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. If you're keeping up, that means that the elect cannot not be saved and that the non-elect cannot be saved. Did you get that? If you're elected, God's grace is going to be irresistible. So you're going through your life and one day you're going to, you're going, you're going to find the Lord. You can't stop it. You've been chosen. You're the elect. They're unable to resist God's invitation to salvation. And again, the non-elect cannot be saved. They don't have a choice either. Unconditional election and irresistible grace means that no matter what they do, some people are going to heaven, and no matter what they do, some people are not. That's what Calvinism believes. So you got T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and then P stands for, number five, the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. This, mean, this is a belief that says that a saved person cannot lose his salvation. In Baptist circles, you've heard it, once saved, always saved. In John 10, 28, Jesus said that he gives eternal life to those who are his and that they will never perish. So there you have the tulip, the basic tenets of Reformed theology or Calvinism. Now, on the other side of that, and the other side of that theological spectrum is what's known as Arminian theology or Arminianism. Jacob Arminius lived from 1560 to 1609. He studied theology under Calvin's successor in Geneva. But he could not reconcile what the Bible says with what that theology taught. 
And so he rebelled against it. And he came up with his own theology that's known as Arminianism. And it's, it's a kind of opposite Calvinism. Armenian theology has eight foundational beliefs. They're in your outline. Number one, they believe in universal prevenient grace. Universal prevenient grace. Armenians believe that grace enables a man to choose God. Grace enables this broken, depraved man to choose God. In John 12, 32, Jesus said that he would draw all men to himself. In Titus 2, 11, it says that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. In other words, God gives all men grace so that whosoever will may come. Without God's grace, they wouldn't. But now all men have been given grace, and so all men can. Grace has freed men's wills so that they now can respond to God's offer of salvation. Universal prevenient grace. Number two. And my pages are out of order, but I caught it. The second one is conditional election. Conditional election. To them, the elect are those who God foreknows will be his. Those God foreknows who, who will be his. Remember, God is eternal. So it means God is at every point in history at the same time. He's in the past, the present, and the future right now at the same time. He's also omniscient. He knows everything. So before God even formed you, he knew every decision you'd ever make. He knew every sin you'd ever commit. He knew everything you'd ever do. He knew everything you'd think about doing because of his knowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 2 says that God's people are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Romans 8, 29 says that those God predestined are those that he foreknew. So are Christians predestined? They would say yes. But the predestination is based upon God foreknowing that they would choose to be his. The elect are those who choose to trust and follow Jesus. That is the condition of their election. They're conditionally elected because they have chosen the, to follow Jesus and God, before he even made them, knew that they would. So the chosen are those who choose to follow Jesus. Conditional election. Number three, they believe in unlimited universal atonement. Unlimited universal atonement. Armenians believe that Christ died for the whole world. Why they believe that? Because what the Bible says. Romans 6, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, and 1 Peter 3, 8, all say that Christ died for all. Now, I talked earlier about if it, the Bible says what it means, means what it says. If the, if the normal sense makes sense, don't try to make it mean something else. If somebody said somebody died for all, what do you think? They died for all. But see, a Calvinist has to tell you that that doesn't mean all. That means some. Well, why didn't it say some? It says all. 1 John 2, 2 says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That means he literally paid our hell, paid our debt. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Well, why would it say that if it didn't mean that? Therefore, Christ's death, the atonement, was for all, not just for some. For everyone, not just those who Calvinists believe were unconditionally elected. Number four, Armenians believe in resistible grace. Resistible grace. This means that God does not violate man's choice in salvation. So God gives man grace, the grace to choose, prevenient grace, but then he doesn't make him choose. He's free. We've seen that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Now follow with me. This is a great lesson on thinking. 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, 9 make it clear that God desires for all men to be saved. The Bible says that Jesus draws all men to himself. If, God, if Jesus died for all, wants them all to be saved, and draws them all to himself, 
then why aren't all men saved? Well, there's only one explanation is yes. because they can resist God. They can say no. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 says that the majority of people resist grace. Jesus said there are many on the broad way which is headed for destruction, but there are few on the narrow way which is headed to life. The rich young ruler chose money over God's will. Did he not have the ability to choose either way? Was it predestined for him? Or did he say, no, I think I'll take the cash. He was able to resist what God wanted for him. And again, if, if God desires all men to be saved, which it says twice in, in the New Testament, if he draws all men to himself, and he does all the saving regardless of what they do, why wouldn't he save everybody? As Ricky Ricardo would say to Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Okay? Makes no sense. Listen, we don't place reason above revelation. But you have to use reason to understand revelation. Don't throw your brain away. God gave it to you. And don't give it away to somebody else, not even me. Again, I'm not trying to tell you what to think. I'm trying to teach you how to think. The Bible clearly teaches that man is responsible for his sin and that he'll spend eternity in hell if he doesn't repent of his sin. If what men do is predetermined by God, then how can man be responsible for choices that he has no power to make? Man must have a choice to be responsible. You don't hold a newborn responsible for messing its diaper because the baby doesn't yet have the capacity to do otherwise. It'd be cruel. Seems to me that it's irresponsible to hold somebody responsible when they do not have the ability to be responsible. That makes sense? The Bible's full of what God tells us that we should do. If God's already predetermined what we will do, why bother telling us to do it? Jesus tells us to follow him. If it's predetermined that I will or I won't, then what's the point of asking me to or tell me that's what I'm supposed to do? If I'm going to do it any, do a certain thing anyway. The commands to obey God all presuppose that we have the choice to either do it or not do it. Was Adam and Eve's choice to sin predetermined? Or were they free to choose? If it was predetermined by God, then what God predetermined created the whole mess we're in. It's his fault, not Adam and Eve's, not man's. He created the very problem he now has to send his son to solve. If they weren't free to choose, and if God in his sovereignty predetermines everything that happens, then couldn't God have predetermined that they would obey and the fall and the curse have been avoided? And couldn't he have predetermined that the angels would not have rebelled, followed their leader Lucifer, and avoided the entire reality of hell? Because hell's made for the devil's demons. But if angels are free to choose, and they were, and man's free to choose, and he is, then all of it makes sense. Again, the Calvinists, on the other hand, believes that God is controlling what man does. They use verses like this, Isaiah 46.10. It says, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. In other words, I'm God, I'll do whatever I want to do and nobody can stop me. Now, God could do that. So sovereignty of God, you're going to see, is not about what God can do. God can do anything he chooses to. But it's about what God chooses not to do, primarily. Another verse they use is Proverbs 16, 9. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So you got this principle of resistible grace. God gives grace, to, grace of God, pure, bringing salvation to all men. But obviously all men didn't take it. The fifth one is the uncertainty of perseverance. The uncertainty of perseverance. They believe that a believer can fall from grace. As you think about these two sides, you've got to remember, Joseph Arminius is reacting to what we now know as Calvinism. He could not believe that those who claimed to be elect could keep on sinning any way they chose and still go to heaven. 
Four passages in the New Testament list sins that have to be repented of in order for a person to inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Ephesians 5, 5, Revelation 21, 8. As I mentioned earlier, Hebrews 5, 9 says that Jesus became to all those who obey him the source of eternal life. John 3, 36, Jesus said, he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Hebrews 10, 26, 26, 27 says, if you go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. So he's saying, there's no way you can just keep on sinning any way you want to sin and still get to heaven. So therefore, the uncertainty of perseverance. Now, many who land on the side of free choice curiously embrace the Calvinist side of, of, of eternal security. And by the way, if you're, in case you're wondering, I believe that once a person is saved, he's always saved. But he's got to really be saved. And if he really gets saved, he gets changed. If, if, he, if, if he got you, then you got him. If you got him, you got changed. If you didn't get changed, you didn't get him. And if you didn't get him, it's because he never got you. That makes sense? A Christian can't just go on, or, or somebody can't come to Christ, the, the, the third person of the Trinity live inside of you? And did not change you? Make you perfect? No. Change you? Absolutely. You can't get over it. You can backslide a little. You can fall away a little, but you can't fall away a lot because Christ lives in you. Now, so many do this. They preach that if you'll just believe and pray this prayer, ask Jesus in your heart or life, then your future in heaven is secure. So a while back, I heard somebody say this about someone. It was about a kid. Since he prayed this prayer, he never has to worry about whether or not he'll go to heaven when he dies. So a kid in Bible school can pray a prayer and live like the devil and still go to heaven. Wow. I've never found that in the Bible. And you won't either. It's not in there. Un uncertainty of perseverance. Number six is libertarian, libertarian free will. Libertarian free will. Armenians believe that man's choices have not, are not predetermined by God. They're not predetermined. Free will is a central belief in Armenian theology. This means that man makes his own choices. They are not predetermined by God. I've explained this by saying that God doesn't micromanage our lives. We do. We do. Number seven. Seven is equal, impartial, and undifferentiated love. Equal, impartial, and undifferentiated love. Armenians believe that God loves all men equally. You probably have been taught that no matter where you were. God loves everybody and he loves them the same. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world. It's not talking about the planet. The most natural interpretation of that verse is God loves everybody. Romans 5, 8 says that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Our sin couldn't even keep God from loving us. God loves us all. He loves us all the same. His love for us is about who he is, not who we are. God doesn't love us because we're good. He loves us because he's good. He doesn't love us because of how we're performing. He loves us because of how he's performing. That's how he can love everybody. That's why he can tell us to love our enemies. Why? Loving your enemies is about, is about the kind of person you are, not the kind of person they are. It's about you determining how you behave, not letting them determine how you behave. Arminius was reacting to what Calvin taught. Unconditional election says that God's choice of who will be saved has nothing to do with man or his choices. Again, in other words, God chooses one man for heaven, one man for hell, and neither has any choice about it. It's just what's going to happen. Now, to me, I just have to ask this question. How could God love a man and create him for hell and there's nothing he can do about it? If that's true, you got to get John 3.16 out of the Bible and a whole bunch of other verses. 
I mean, how could God, how can you think that God loved a person that he made to send to hell? And the man has no, cho no choice, no option. There's nothing to do about it. He's not one of the elect. And again, what, what the answers I've been, had when I've had these conversations, people, God is God. He can do whatever he wants to do. Limited Thomas says Jesus only died for those God chose. If this is true, shouldn't John 3, 16 say, for God so loved some, few according to Matthew 7, 14, that he sent his only begotten son? To me, you got to do some real mental and, and spiritual gymnastics to think that God loves somebody that he created to send to hell. Now, if you're new here, and especially if you're not a Christian, don't know your Bible, God never sends anybody to hell. Hell is what happens, is the place people go who don't want God. If you don't want God, it's okay. He'll give you the option. But the option is you don't get him. If you don't get him, everything good comes from him. So everything good's going to be in heaven because the one who is good from whom all good comes is in heaven. He's what makes heaven heaven. And hell will be the absence of everything good because God is not there. So see, in the end, everybody gets what they want. Everybody wants to be with God, gets to be with God. And everybody wants God to leave them alone, God leaves them alone. But they have no idea what that's going to cost them because God's not in hell, good's not there. It's dark, why? Because God's light. <laughs> it's full of agony, why? Because heaven has none. It's the opposite. Now, we're created in God's image. Even in our brokenness, we have characteristics that are like his. And one of those is the idea of fairness. The Bible teaches that life in a cursed world isn't fair. Ecclesiastes makes that infinitely clear. It does not teach that God is not fair. The biblical word for fairness is justice. And God is just. Even small children have a sense of what is fair or unfair. And you could get, go over here at the preschool and get some four-year-olds and have a bunch of cookies and give, give uh, three of them four and give one of them one. And these little children, born in the image of God, even though it's damaged, would say, that's not fair. They're old enough to figure that out. Is it fair for God to send somebody to hell who had, had no option? Some would say, yeah, it is, amazingly. Does man possess a sense of fairness that God doesn't have? Armenians believe that God loves all men equally. If you're a parent, it, this makes sense to love all men equally. If you're not a parent, it makes sense for, us, for God to love us because of what we do and how we behave, because that's mostly how we love each other. But it doesn't make sense for God to, to make one person for heaven, therefore loving that person, and another person for hell, not loving that person for no reason at all. Just doesn't make sense. And last of all, Armenians believe in the universal call of salvation. The universal call of salvation. God calls all men to himself. All men. Not just the elect, not some, all. All men are offered salvation. First John, or John chapter 1 verse 9 says, Jesus enlightens every man. If a man not, can, cannot be saved, isn't spiritual light a cruel tease? Think about it. If he cannot be saved, isn't spiritual light a cruel tease? In John 12, 32, Jesus said that he would draw all men to himself. Again, is this not a cruel tease to be drawn to a Christ that you cannot get to? So I'm going to draw you to me, but you're not going to make it. It ain't going to happen no matter what you do. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Again, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. If atonement is limited, and if election is unlimited, then salvation has come to some men, not to all. Number eight is the universal call of salvation. God calls all men to himself. They're all offered salvation. So again, it says, Jesus enlightens every man, John 1, 9. It'd be cruel to give you light, but not let you see. 
John 12, 30, 32 says, Jesus would draw all men to himself. So I'm going to draw you, but you never can know me. I'm going to tease you to be mine, but you'll never be mine. I just can't imagine a just God would do such a thing. Titus 2, 11, the grace of God's appeared to all men. If atonement is limited, if election's unconditional, then salvation's come to some men, not to all. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever will call, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, the Reformed explanation is that you won't call on the name of the Lord unless you're elect. This is the praise team. They're getting ready. They're not going to come up and kiss me. You can relax, okay? <laughs> uh, mm. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. We've talked about choice. Notice this verse is full of choices. You wish or desire to follow Jesus. You deny yourself. You take up your cross. You choose to do this daily. You follow him. So why would Jesus ask people to make choices that are already predetermined for them? Some of you know the name of radio host Steve Brown. His voice is a little deeper than mine. If you know who that is, that's really funny. Not too long ago, I heard him talking about sanctification on the radio, and he said this. He said, he was talking about if you don't understand it, quote, don't worry about it, it'll just all work out. And I was dumbfounded. Is God going to sanctify you even if you don't understand what he's doing? Can I be sanctified, become more like Jesus without even trying? I've never known anybody become more like Jesus who wasn't trying to be more like Jesus. Have you? Reformed theologians are forever declaring and explaining their position on Calvinism. They preach sermons, they conduct interviews, they do podcasts, they write books. Those toward the Armenian side seem to spend little, if any, time defending their position. They think, why is that the case? My personal explanation is this. That the entire tulip, if you're going to try to go with the five points, you can, you can argue the fifth one pretty good. But if you try to go with the five points of the tulip, it takes a lot of explaining and a lot of convincing. You write a book and then you've got to write another book and then you've got to write another book and then you've got to write another book. The Armenian side of things doesn't take all that because it biblically and intuitively just makes sense. Doesn't it? Now, again, understand that these beliefs appear on a continuum. They're hardcore five-point Calvinists, and they're more moderate Calvinists. They're hardcore, uh, hardcore uh, Armenians over on this side, and then there are more moderate Armenians. There are Armenians who, Armenians who believe that you can fall from grace. Get saved, get lost, get saved, get lost, get saved, get lost. There are others who believe that, no, you don't actually fall from grace. It just proves you were never a Christian when it looks like you fell from grace. Just who you were, show. Remember Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll see by the end of this study that I believe that those on the extremes of these positions are both missing the truth. You'll see that these verses that seem might, to, might seem to contradict others are in fact complementary of each other and complete each other. There are a bunch of foundational truths that, you're going to, that you need to understand. It's going to be a great study. Now, if you're hearing this today and you've been taught diehard Calvinism or to be a diehard Arminian, I probably have made you a little uncomfortable. You're going to find me to be a little too Arminian for a Calvinist, and you're going to find me to be a little Calvinistic for an Arminian. If you stay with me, though, you'll find me to be thoroughly biblical. Thoroughly biblical. Let's let the Bible speak. Let's try not to interpret it through our predetermined theological lens and see what it says. Now, there is one thing that both sides agree on. If you want to be saved, you can be saved.